Hi guys, my name is Richard Nongo. I'm a passion fruit farmer. I'm based here in Tika. I'm very passionate about this fruit. I don't know why it's called passion fruit, but I'm very passionate about it. And uh, this is my story. Uh, my farming ideas kicked off, uh, I think, around 2010. I ventured into the normal farming of uh, maize, whereby I did around 80 acres, because I also ventured into, I entered into my neighbor's land because that allowed me to, to plow and farm. Unfortunately, that did not work out too well because uh, the rains failed, as at times it happens. And uh, I found myself almost giving up the first time, but then I went back in the second time. But after the third attempt, I saw like, I'm not doing something right. So I stepped back and I felt like, maybe I wasn't born to be a farmer because I'm an engineer by profession. And at the time I was doing other engineering activities as well. So I, I walked away from the farm for a while, for almost like seven years. Then what brought me back is uh, the guy I had here at the farm, I was informed by my neighbor that he had brought in some Chinese to come and take samples of the maram. And uh, they had actually ordered to come in and, and remove the maram. And I felt that was going to mess up my, my, my land. So I came back, uh, I spoke to the chief, I spoke to the police and got out the, the, guy, the guy out and brought in a new guys to check out for me the, the place. But then I felt my coming just to check the place, it does not make any economic sense. Then. Somewhere along the way, a friend of mine, a pastor, he, he mentioned to me about passion and he told me that they want to go to Kamwangi and see some, some vineyards there for passion. So I said, why not? I accompanied him. So when I, when I saw what guys were doing, I was like, I think I could do this, you know? I mean, being that it's not like an intricate crop and not many people are able to do it because of uh, the, the, the waiting period, the amount of investment required, I felt Probably I could do this because uh, not very many people are going to eat like maize, tomatoes, those three month crops. But then I wanted to do it right. So uh, after consulting here and there, one of the guys that had gone to his farm is now one who introduced me to the person who was selling to him the seedlings. So I had a meeting with him at Blue Post. Then we came to the farm. He saw there was a lot of potential here. Then uh, we agreed that we do a small block, which we started with a very small block, just to see how it works out. And then it turned out it was like a, a miracle for us because the crop did so well. And then what surprised us, whereby, where they're in their region, which is near the Badea, is a bit cooler, they have T-zones there by, uh, and the environment, they get harvest for about half the year. We harvested the whole year. So we were like, wow, we could be into something good here. Then I ventured to another farm that they deal with almost 14 different varieties of uh, crops. And now I got the science of farming from those guys. They're called Farmworks in, uh, in uh, Embu. So I invited one of the directors to come here and visit my place and uh, it's called Peter. And uh, he was able to give me a lot of insight and introduce me now to an agronomist so that I could be able to approach it from a professional angle. And we were able to learn a lot of things of how to do farming in, uh, in an approach whereby you take farming as an art and a science, not the way we tend to approach farming. When we started off, we started almost like uh, on an acre, which was about uh, a thousand seedlings. Eh? And uh, we got uh, a very low yield at the time because our focus was letting the vine to grow. So by virtue of that, we removed the, the new suckers and we also removed the flowers. So we did not allow the plant to fruit because we wanted the, all the energies of growth to go into the vine to be able to stretch out and, and spread out. We forewent rather the, the fruit at the expense of the vine growing. So our vine actually went up very, very fast. So, but of course we did not have any yield at that time. So once we reached the, the, the wire, which is, as you can see behind me up here, now we now allowed it now to start fruiting. And I think it was a good thing also in itself because the, uh, when it started now fruiting, 
The yield was uh, initially, I would put it at maybe something like uh, 400 kilos in a week. And then uh, we went up to almost uh, 800 kilos in a week. By then we had realized the fruit was doing well, it was in the right environment. So we kicked off, that was in October 2019. So by May 2020, we kicked off now this crop you're seeing behind me. And by November, we had reached two tons. Per, uh, per, that was now per, per month. But by January 2021, we managed to do a total of 5.9 tons in the whole of, of January. Then March, it went down a bit to about three tons. Then in March 2021, that is last month, we managed to do 6.5 tons. So that compels us even now more to have the need of doing a third block, which is what we are focusing on right now, and we want to kick it off in, uh, in the month of May. I would say the tonnage would fluctuate by virtue of the fact that this is a vine and it keeps growing, it keeps extending. So as it extends, it produces new suckers. The new suckers comes with new fruit. So with time, we expect the yield to to grow with, with the crop as the cro crop is also growing. But then, uh, after probably two to three years time, we would also expect the crop now to have reached the end of its life. And of course, now it will start diminishing. Thereby, we feel the need to now do the third crop to maintain our production. For you to get a good fruit, the key element actually is, uh, I would say number one is water. The more water you give the vine, the better you'll have uh, the taste of the fruit. Secondly, you need to, to put in uh, inputs. Preferably, you can use uh, the normal manure of goat and uh, cows, but you have, have more of the goat. And then uh, you can put the other inputs now, like the calmabon. Calmabon is calcium, magnesium, and boron. The calcium and magnesium is always, is always present in the soil, but you may find it's, it's kind of imbalanced. Now when you come and spray directly on the leaves, the plant is able to feed directly the calcium and the magnesium which is balanced and thereby it's able to not to able to draw for itself any surplus it requires from the soil despite the fact that it's not balanced. Now the boron uh, also plays a part in the sweetness of the fruit. This is because when you have the flowers, the flowering stage of the, of the plant, you need a bee to visit that flower. They say, the agronomists tell us, it should be an average of seven times every flower. You can't control the visits of the bees to the flower. But with boron, when you introduce boron, it helps in the pollination of the flower. So once the, the, the flower has been uh, pollinized properly, you are bound to get also a good fruit. Another thing that we are very keen about is that we don't pluck our fruit. We let the fruit to mature and allow it to drop. So what we do, we actually pick the fruit from, uh, from the ground. As you can see right here, this fruit has fallen on its own, meaning it's mature and ready for the, for the market. It may not be have, having turned fully into purple, but give it like uh, two days. It would probably be the purple color that uh, the market wants. But now we will not have to wait for it to turn purple for us to get to the market, because we need to get the market for the market now to take it to the consumer, that's the time now it should actually have really turned for it to have a good uh, shelf life. The reason that we don't opt to pluck, there is a aspect of somebody plucking the fruit that is not fully mature. The other danger would be as you are plucking the fruit, you injure the vine, uh, you damage the suckers, uh, or as you are plucking as the fruit as well, you can transfer maybe a disease from one vine to the next yeah so it is safer to allow the fruit to just drop pick you have a mature fruit and also you don't have the risk of damaging the, the crop and spreading also disease the seedlings that we use here we actually grow them ourselves in our own nursery we start with the coast they call it coast yellow or the Zimbabwe it is actually uh, the yellow passion we use that as a tap root because of the rooting system of the Zimbabwe, the coast yellow, is, is much better because it has a tap root that goes for the water. And the, the root system is, is stronger and better in terms of resisting the challenges that we experience in the soil because of the soil diseases. And uh, it's very, also a good feeder. 
Then we have the purple, which we graft with. Once the, the, the coast yellow of the Zimbabwe has come up, so there are two ways of doing it. You can either do it in the nursery, whereby you first plant the coast yellow, then you graft it there, or you can come and plant the Zimbabwe direct. Then after it has grown, then you come and, and graft. But for somebody who needs to come and buy the seedling and go, we'd have to sell to them now the one that is already grafted. And that would retail for about 50 shillings for a seedling, the one that has been grafted. If you want the one that's not grafted, it'd probably go for about 30 shillings. And uh, we we'd, would uh, have on average in stock between 3,000 to 5,000 seedlings. If you go into this project, the, big, the bigger the project, of course, the more cost effective it will be. But I would not want somebody to go into it that way. The safer approach would be go either into either half an acre or an acre. And that will mean you'll need between 500 to 1,000 because we say 1,000 seedlings is suitable for an acre. Monitor the crop, get to learn the ropes, study the challenges, and grow with the crop. Then once you know exactly what you're doing, then I would encourage you now to expand. You don't even need to have the land, you can even lease the land. I would recommend that uh, you first check the kind of soil that you have, the kind of region that you are in, because apparently this crop, they say it's supposed to be a high altitude crop. How it is working out here at approximately maybe around 1200 meters above sea level, it just happens to be like a good, a good region for us. But ideally they say this is a high altitude crop and that is why you'll find most of the farmers that were doing passion actually in Eldoret, the Wasingation area, because there it's a lot easier to grow this crop without the many challenges that we face here. I think being a warmer place, we have more pests. And uh, I would say for a new farmer, regardless of where you are, apart from maybe the coast, because now the, the, the lower the altitude gets, you may need now to switch from the purple passion to the yellow passion because the yellow one uh, is what we would refer to as like the coast yellow. So if you go there with the purple, you may not really be in the right environment. I would say for a new farmer, probably uh, red soil would be the best for you. Make sure you have a good water source because this is a vine. It takes in a lot of water and have your soil tested so that you know what, what you need to, whether your pH is too high or is too low. You may need to introduce lime to stabilize it. You make sure you have a good source of getting manure. And of course, from the word go, make sure you have the right seedling. If you don't have the right seedling, you're, you're off on a wrong course. The kind of seedlings we have here, we've tested them by planting and growing and monitoring and seeing the production. So I can as well as confidently say, I think we have the right, we have the right seedling and I would recommend this variety. We normally give it about uh, between 500 to 600,000 per acre because also of the waiting period. Because all along you're going to cut the cost of labor as well. Yes. So I would give it between 500 to 600,000 because even the structure depending on what you're going to use. You may choose to use expensive material like what we have here. We have some concrete posts which are a bit pricey. Or you can use the cheaper poles. But I would recommend uh, a, good, a good structure because when the wind comes in, you don't want your, your vines to start falling because once the vine hits the ground, it will never go back the way, the way it was. You know. You can get an accident car back on the road and looking good, but this one, trust you me, once it hits the ground, they, 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 you'll suffer injuries. There'll be breakages, some circuses will, will, uh, will bend. It, it will be, it will be disa disastrous. So the structure has to be good. The wire that you use, I would recommend the galvanized wire. Don't use the normal binding wire because it's cheaper. It may be cheaper initial cost, but it will introduce a disease because of the rust, because it's going to rust. The galvanized wire is going to give you a long, long service without experiencing issue challenges of rust and corrosion. So get the right materials, get the right manure, and when you're planting the, the, the initial seedling, you need a bit of chicken manure, about uh, a handful, together with the, 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 the goat and, and cow manure. You mix it well with soil, make sure if it's not raining season, make sure you put water maybe like two occasions so that the manure can gel well with the soil. So you don't want to put in your seedling before the manure has stabilized because it's going to burn the roots. Then on planting day, introduce about a handful of, uh, of chicken manure 
chicken manure is good because in spite of the fact that it's going to decompose very fast, it's able to jumpstart the, the crop. So the seedling, it will be a new environment, it will feed quickly on the chicken manure, get its root system in place, and then it will be able to shoot. You may find it kind of getting sluggish initially, the first couple of four or five days because of being disturbed. But it will be able to take off once you make sure you have sufficient water, and then you have your structure in place for, for training, training the, the vine, because you need to have the, the poles, you need to have the wire, and then you need to have the strings coming down for the vine to follow the string as you train it. With the proper management, and also with your area, the region that you're going to be in, in this kind of region we are lucky because we're able to harvest throughout the year, but most people where they are, which is higher, at higher altitude places, they tend to harvest for just half the, half the year. The other half, they don't have flowers, they don't have crop. But for, if you're in the right region, a warm area with good soil, good water, you, should, you could be lucky enough to have a, a harvest throughout the year, only that it will be fluctuating. You'll find in one month you have higher crop, the next month maybe it goes a bit down. Normally it would go for like two months, high yield, then it will go down for like a month, then again it comes back. So it it's kind of oscillates, it's not consistent. But if you have a big, a big farm and you have uh, several blocks, that you've planted intermittently, you're likely to have now almost a consistent crop because when this one maybe is uh, diminishing, the other one now is yielding. Yeah, so you're able to be able to maintain supply for your market. With proper management, these vines will vary in terms of duration of uh, their lifespan, yeah? uh, based on the variety. If you have a high yield variety like this one, we expect it to give us at least two and a half years of yield. There is another variety that is not as high yield, it will probably give you up to maybe four years. So subject, subject to the management and the kind of plant that you will put in, uh, personally I would recommend this high yield variety. It will go for a shorter lifespan, but it will be giving us a lot of crop, eh? as opposed to the one that is low yield and lasts longer. The mar marketing of the, of the fruit is uh, a market that kind of, I mean the fruit sells itself. Only that now that we have the lockdown and the restaurants are closed, so the demand for the passion juice probably has gone down a bit. But I think because of the awareness of people needing to take in a lot of vitamin C, people are taking in a lot more fruit into their diet than before. And uh, other than the time we have the mangoes in season, this fruit doesn't really have much competition. It kind of sells itself. So as so long as you get a good fruit that is sweet, you're bound to to sell free, a, a smooth ride all the way to the market. At this farm, I think the next thing would be more passion. We are going to do probably another three or four more blocks of passion. We are uh, hoping to go maybe up to maybe 20,000 uh, vines. Probably at, maybe we, we are thinking of making the crop probably five times what we have currently and only doubling the labor. Because now we've managed to streamline our workers we have systems, so the, the return on investment probably will be much better then because we have more crop with probably just additional labor of probably double. And uh, God willing then uh, if all works out as we aspire is, is that uh, we could go into value addition and maybe start juicing and, and packing and reaching out to even foreign markets. Once you're able to satiate the, the local market, if we can, we could also reach out to the, the foreign markets. That is my story as a passion fruit farmer. I'm curious to know your agribusiness story. Share it.